Uh, excited to be kicking off LISCON here in Lisbon. Uh, let's give a, a round of applause to the organizers for putting on this great event. And the, uh, the Ethereum ecosystem is on fire right now. It's such an exciting time to be uh, working on decentralization. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Web3 today and what we need to do to finish building out this platform. So I, I tweeted this last month, and so um, that's basically my talk. So I can spend the rest of my time up here uh, hitting harmonies or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, I do, I do want to give uh, credit where credit is due. Um, you know, the uh, idea of decentralized applications running on a world computer was part of the Ethereum vision from the very beginning when it launched in 2015. Uh, and the work that Juan Benet has done on IPFS and, and the whole Protocol Labs team has been really foundational uh, to the space. So I really consider uh, these guys to be kind of the uh, original fathers of Web3. Uh, we started working on the graph in 2017. And at Graph Day in January 2019, I gave this keynote where I said that you know, Web3 was going to be better than Web2 in almost every way, both for users and developers, and that um, we just had a lot of work ahead of us to build out this platform and realize this vision. Shortly after, we got into uh, Web3 winter, right? And it was brutal. You know, uh, every crypto VC was telling me that it was crazy to work on Web3, that blockchains were only good for censorship-resistant money, maybe some DeFi. Um, and you could fit everybody that was still working on Web3 in like a single room together. But we kept working on it. And uh, December 2019, I published this blog post, uh, The Path to Web3, kind of as an act of defiance and you know, to try to plant a flag to say that this thing is real. And, uh, and I ended the post saying, you know, Web3 has its own unique capabilities. Uh, developers will have better building blocks with open APIs and programmable money. Users will have more control and freedom of choice. And once we put these pieces together into a compelling package that developers can easily build on, a new race will start. We, we are getting close to the starting line. Just like Ethereum allowed a wave of innovation that ignited the imagination, engineers working on decentralization are going to build one level up from there. The Web3 platform made of many protocols and components will reignite creative spirits and summer will return. And it has been a glorious summer. Um, we are in the midst of a renaissance. People working on art, NFTs, DAOs, reimagining systems of coordination, and rethinking how people relate to the world around them. And this has been sparked by Web3. But what is Web3? I know, it's the vibes, right? You, uh, you know, get some GIFs, you know, definitely some JPEGs, uh, you know, sprinkle some crypto magic, and that's Web3, right? Well, the vibes are definitely important, but uh, let's try to find like a, a more uh, specific definition. The Web3 is a new platform for decentralized applications. And that's really what separates Web3 from the web, right? The web has a client-server architecture, which means you know, whoever runs the server has complete control. Um, and uh, we want to decentralize power, control, decision-making, and resources. And that's only possible if we build truly decentralized applications on top of a fully decentralized protocol stack. And that means no servers, right? If you are running servers with custom code running on those servers, um, that is not Web3, right? You have all of the same power imbalances that you have with the web. It's just a traditional web application. And it can be really tempting to just, you know, throw some logic on a server and say it's just like a small feature. But the problem is once you do that, the incentive is there to keep adding more and more functionality on the server and, uh, and that's a point of centralization. And so um, it really is binary. 
And uh, you know, the reason that people, you know, projects are running these servers today, it's not because they're bad or they're evil, it's, it's just because the Web3 stack isn't finished being built yet. So that's why it's so important for us to finish building the Web3 stack so that people can build incredible applications that are every bit as good as the apps that people are used to using, no you know, compromise to user experience, but they run on a fully decentralized stack. And that will allow us to break free from authorities. Right? Civilizations are structured around sources of authority. Right? For over a thousand years, the authority was you know, the church working together with the king, and, uh, and together you know, they would define how resources were distributed, how decisions were made, even what was considered truth. Um, then with the invention of the printing press, um, the, the power balance changed because suddenly anybody could, you know, publish the written word and spread their ideas, um, you know, releasing the monopoly that, that the state and the church had. Um, in the 20th century, power got reconcentrated uh, because of the consolidation of media companies, specifically television, uh, radio, and, uh, um, and t uh, newspapers, and those media corporations um, working in tandem with the state often, um, you know, were the authorities. And today it's the internet companies, right? Facebook, Google, that really, um, you know, are the authorities, again, sometimes working with the state. And uh, we need to break free from authorities, right? So that everybody can be free to live their lives the way that they want, so that we can be free to, to coordinate, you know, self-organize um, in the ways that we choose. And central to the idea of authority is the idea to determine what is true. And, you know, we're seeing this front and center, um, you know, with the internet, you know, and things like fake news, this idea now of reestablishing who are the sources of authority and how do we determine truth is one of the, the largest uh, civilizational issues that, that we need to tackle. Um, so today, if you're browsing uh, an internet application like Twitter, you have to completely trust the service provider um, to tell you what is true. Right? If I'm looking at this tweet, I know that it's coming from Elon because somebody at Twitter, the corporation, verified his identity and gave me this blue check mark. Um, the twi you know, uh, in their database, they're storing you know, the content, uh, the timestamp, uh, the number of likes. And, uh, and only clients that are approved by the Twitter corporation can access that information. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? Um, Elon could sign his messages, and then you could verify that you know, the message came from him using public key cryptography. Uh, the metadata could be stored on a storage network. Um, the hash could be anchored on chain so that everybody can verify that the tweet was published as of a certain block, and that data could be indexed and queried uh, using um, uh, an indexing protocol like the graph, and, uh, and suddenly, uh, you know, this information would be verifiable. And verifiability is really key to this whole thing. And what verifiability means is that the clients can verify for themselves using a cryptographic proof that the information that they're looking at is correct. Right? You want to be able to look at a screen like this and know that you know, every piece of information that you're seeing is true, um, even if you don't trust the service provider and you assume that they're malicious that is giving you that information, there's a proof that allows you to verify for yourself. Right? And if you can't verify, then you have to trust, and if you have to trust, then you're not in control. So at a high level, we can think of Web3 as starting with a set of infrastructure protocols, um, which are open, permissionless, decentralized networks that you can think of as the hardware that everything runs on, and there are many of these. Then on top, you have smart contract protocols um, that define things like roles and permissions and value flows. Um, those can run on blockchains, for example. Um, and then you have the dApps. And the dApps are the user's interface to all of these protocols. And for the, the user to have control, the dApps need to run on the end user's device, completely under their control. And then they interact with all of these protocols uh, using open APIs like the graph. So you can roughly think about um, 
you know, these uh, infrastructure protocols as uh, having on-chain and off-chain components. Um, this diagram isn't exact, but um, the on-chain stuff is the stuff that's working really well today. Right? We've got layer ones like Ethereum and others. Um, layer twos are working now for scalability. Um, and so this stuff is, is working well. Um, and then the part that we still need to work on is these off-chain bits. Right? This is the stuff that today um, a lot of projects are you know, falling back to you know, running custom servers for some of this off-chain stuff. Um, and that, that can be everything from like, you know, user tables to additional metadata, social features like likes and follows. Uh, but luckily, there are um, protocols for off-chain data that are getting to a really good place now. Protocols like Textile and Ceramic that allow you to implement those same types of features in a decentralized way. Uh, so a, a big part of the work that we have to do now to finish building out the Web3 stack is um, bridging together the on-chain and the off-chain data worlds, making that really easy for developers and for users so that we can build all of the different types of applications that we want on a fully decentralized stack. And you know, platforms are generalizable, so it really doesn't matter whether you're building in DeFi, NFTs, DAOs, social, or any other application. Um, you, know, you can build all of those things on the Web3 stack. And what we want to target for user experience is you know, any application, whether it's notes or calendar or like DAO tools, you should be able to start in a local, you know, offline kind of mode where you know, all of the data stays on your device. And, um, and uh, from there, uh, if you want to collaborate with some other people in a team or in a like, trusted setting, you should be able to do that in a completely peer-to-peer -peer way, right, with Google Docs styles syncing of your state, um, but without having to rely on any centralized services to you know, collect your data or act as a, a central point of failure. And then if you want to publish your data, uh, you should be able to, to publish that to the global graph of all of the world's public knowledge and information where it can be verifiable and accessible to everybody, um, again, on open permissionless networks. Now, um, since the beginning, the story for uh, verifiability for blockchains has been light clients. Right, so the most secure way to verify information on a blockchain is actually to run a full node. And that means that you're downloading all of the blocks and you're validating every single block from Genesis. Uh, but that takes a considerable amount of resources. And so the story for end user devices has been light clients. That's kind of the next step up where you don't need to download all of the blocks, but instead you just download the headers and you can verify that the headers are correct and then you can verify that, for example, a specific state variable in a smart contract has a certain value as of a certain block. Um, you know, you have to work in, in tandem with a full node, uh, but you can verify that for yourself on the client. Now, the problem with light clients is, one, they still actually consume a lot of resources, so it is difficult to work, you know, to have them run smoothly on, like, mobile phones. Uh, but the bigger problem is that Web3 applications need more information than just, you know, the state variables in the smart contract. Um, you know, people use subgraphs to process data from lots of different data sources, build up custom arbitrary views on that data, and that is what you actually need to serve to the applications. And so, like clients aren't enough. You actually need to be able to generate proofs that allow you to verify arbitrary views on blockchain data. And so we're working on that uh, at the graph. Um, the version of the graph network that is live in production today uses crypto economics as its security model. So indexers uh, stake uh, to provide their service to the network, and when they serve query responses, those come with signed attestations that can be used to launch disputes to slash the indexers if uh, the responses that they give are incorrect. Um, but uh, most people don't know this, but we've had a cryptography team working on cutting-edge zero-knowledge proofs for the last two years, 
and we're going to start publishing the research that that team has been doing, first with applications to some uh, shorter term problems, and then to this larger problem of verifiable queries. Um, and uh, what we want to be able to do is uh, to be able to have these indexers ingesting data from these other chains. They're processing that data at indexing time. And then when a query comes in, uh, you want to be able to generate a snark that proves that you did the computation of uh, executing that query correctly and that that's something that's very efficient for a client to verify um, with no trust assumptions. And um, on the graph network today, we also have a set of gateways that are geographically distributed across the globe that facilitate interacting with the decentralized network. And we want to move all of that logic to the client again so that the, the, the client and the user has complete control. And so um, we're starting work on a graph client which encapsulates all of this logic. So that includes the indexer selection, um, so choosing which indexers to use based on criteria like price, performance, security, and anything else uh, that you want. Also moving the state channel wallet to the end user's device so that they're handling their own micropayments per API call to the indexers. Uh, the query engine for actually executing those queries potentially against multiple indexers and the verifications uh, so that just transparently um, they're verifying proofs, the snark proofs on the client. So all of this can be just really easy for developers and just hidden behind so it really just looks like you know, you're using a global GraphQL API to all of Web3, but all of this is happening transparently under the hood on the end user's device. And what that will enable us to do is get to the full vision of Web3, where we have tens of thousands of protocols for every area of the economy um, that are decentralized, that are open and permissionless. On top of those protocols, users can build and use custom interfaces that allow them to transparently you know, use whatever of these services they want, however they want. Um, so that they're really in control of, of their experience and how they design their lives and their work. And the users uh, can build and manage their own identity, data, and reputation on you know, their, their crypto accounts that's all under their control. Um, and so you know, on top of this foundation, new civilizations are going to get built, and it's all going to happen soon. Thank you.